second. Mm -hmm. For those of you that are our, our participants today, um, we try and put each one of the classes and most of the club's activities on YouTube live. And it um, sometimes we have trouble getting it started, um, in which case we just record it and put it up later. But right now it did start and we are live on YouTube. Are you going to So um, this will be online. Are you going to record? Are you going it's to recorded record? on YouTube, yeah, it's all set. Oh, it okay, great. Yeah, it's going right okay. now. It just came up and gave me the note that we're live. And I'm going to, going to introduce Linda. And for those of you that don't know um, Linda Gregory, she's, well, first of all, she's the president of the, of the camera club. So I always have to sing hail to the chief when she comes in, but I didn't do that this morning. <laughs> Kidding, come on, smile here. I, anyway, uh, she's also our club's resident expert on composition. Now, so far in this class, we've kind of given you an overview. We've talked a little bit about the exposure triangle and where to get some information if you're using a DSLR. For those of you that don't remember the answer, it's called YouTube. And, um, you know, if you've got that brand new Canon ZX2937, whatever, you can go to YouTube and find it. And uh, I'm sure you'll find a video on how to use it. Um, or you can just follow Gene's uh, system. I put it on P for perfect and start taking pictures. And it works every single time. Um, no, it works about 90% of the time, but that's our, our, the big thing that makes beautiful pictures, the ones you see hanging on the wall at the club and in magazines and everywhere else is the composition of that picture. And it has little or nothing to do with the brand of camera, the type of camera or anything else. It's in here and it's in your eyes and that's where it's all about. And when I need help with composition and things don't look right, Linda's my go-to person. I go to her and I say, Linda, look at this picture. What's wrong with it? And she usually gives me some really good advice on composition. And it does make a big difference. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm leaving. Um, this is Linda's show and she will take care of you. I'm going to switch over and make Linda. Yeah, I'm going to you make you the host, Linda. You let me share yeah, okay. You have to yep, let me you're share. the host now. Um, there you go. So you can do the screen sharing and everything else. That's all yours. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave everybody and have yourself a good time for the class this morning. Take care. All right. Thank you, bye -bye. Jane. Okay, I like to start with this at the beginning of each one of these presentations um, because as Jean aptly put it, um, it doesn't really matter what kind of camera or device you're taking pictures with, composition is important no matter what you're using. And I, I love this uh, joke, I leave it up for a little while so it can sink in, but um, it is very appropriate. As I say, it doesn't matter what kind of camera you're using, um, composition is going to be important for a good photograph. Okay, I've been taking pictures since I was about 10, and I had a dark room set up in the basement. My photos were awful, but I kept at it on and off. And I got into it when I first got my first SLR in 1966 or 67. And I took a bunch of photography courses and got some lucky shots. And these are just, these are just a few of them. Um, I love this photo. This, uh, this little girl's father loved the photo. Her mother hated it because she had her thumb in her mouth. But um, 
it's one of my favorite portraits that I've ever done. It kind of got me started in, in wanting to take portraits um, later on. The middle photograph uh, I showed to my father, who was also a photographer, and uh, he said, you took that? So I guess he was impressed. And then the one on the right is, of course, Monument Valley. And I took this, pro, let's see, probably about 1999 or 2000 in film, with film. And I really hadn't um, learned much about composition at the time, but this one turned out fantastic. It's one of my favorites. I actually had a painting done of it in, that's hanging in my living room. Um, what, I joined the camera club in about 2006 and started taking classes from the great members that are there. I recommend that you take classes from as many people as you can once we get opened and even the ones that are coming up on Zoom. And I, I have a barking dog. This is an aside. So if I mute myself, you'll know it's because he's barking. Um, anyway. I started really learning more about photography and it was when, when we decided a few years ago that people were starting, we we're getting um, requests from people who wanted to know uh, how to take photos with their phone and cell phone and so on and so forth. We decided, I decided that probably the most important thing that we can teach people besides the actual working of the camera or how a camera works is composition. I can tell you that my photography has improved probably a thousand percent since I joined the camera club way back in 2006. And you'll hear people say, oh yeah, that person has a fantastic eye and some people do, um, but I can guarantee you that if you take some of these basic ideas that I'm going to show you today, that you can 100% improve your photography. And I'm the perfect example of somebody who's done that. Um, I know you're probably, this is, was set up for in the, in the classroom, so discussion was a lot easier. But if you have a, if anybody has a question as we go through this, unmute yourself and, uh, and, and ask the question because um, there's probably a good chance somebody else is asking, wondering the same thing. So these are rules in quotes, um, but rules are always made to be broken. So what is composition? It's the arrangement or placement of visual elements of a photograph to make it more appealing or interesting for the viewer. Good composition can bring boring photograph and make it amazing. It draws the viewer's eye and attention to the mood and emotion you're trying to express with your photograph. So what are the rules of composition? I'm gonna to touch on a few. I, I actually expanded this from my 2019 presentation. So there are more in here than, than there were a couple of years ago. But uh, I'm going to start with the rule of thirds. And you've probably heard this. Um, it's the most popular composition rule, as you can see in the example down in the lower left-hand corner. Um, and this is the, this is the first thing. I, I have to say that when uh, on my Africa trip, um, if I was able to take the time to compose a photograph, because sometimes you can't, there are things are just moving too fast. But if you are, that was the most important thing that I, that I um, focused on was composition. So you can see the photograph is divided into um, nine parts, and they say that the focus of the photograph should be at the intersect of one of the lines here. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but you can see that in this particular case, um, it's 
the intersect is almost on his eyes, his nose, the vertical. And um, I, if you put him in the center, it just wouldn't be as interesting. I think also the way he is leaning, these, all of my, almost all of my portraits are candid. So it's basically um, looking at the subject, either waiting for them to move the way I want them to, or just taking a chance that it's gonna happen like I'm hoping. Um, but you can see in this example, he's basically right on one of the rules of third here. Here's another example though. The first fellow was, I was called a stagecoach driver was taken down in tombstone. Um, the upper left hand portrait was also taken in tombstone. Um, I really got into portrait photography at in tombstone because those guys and people, not just men, are there to be photographed. It's not an issue about taking pictures of them. Um, they and a suggestion, uh, what a couple of us did after we had taken a lot of these portraits, we went back to tombstone with four by six prints of the subjects photograph and gave them to them. And they, some of them offered to pay us for them. Now these are just four by six prints. These aren't big prints, but they were so happy to get them because they never get to see the pictures that people take of them. And they're, and they're always curious. So they were very grateful that we had taken the time to do that. The other photograph here is a photograph I took at Wild, um, White Stallion Ranch before um, the classes started. And you can see the Oriole here. I set up my tripod outside our room and uh, honed in on this particular saguaro cactus in bloom and just waited for the birds to come in. And this guy came in, I love this photograph. It's one of my favorite bird photographs, but you can see he's definitely on the rule of thirds here. Now here are a couple of other portraits. Um, Colton on the left was taken um, at a movie shoot, I think, uh, out near um, Gammon's Gulch. And although he is square on, pretty much square on in the middle of the photograph, his eyes are on the rule of thirds. And what makes this interesting is the fact that he's thrown his hand up. And so it's not a, a, a straight on um, look like a posed portrait, but he definitely knew I was taking his picture, even though it is a candid. And, um, and I, I just, this is a great kid's photograph I love. The photograph on the right was taken at um, Canola Ranch and Anza days. And this woman was on horseback. Um, I was shoot, obviously shooting up. It was a nice sky that day, which sometimes we don't have. But again, her eyes, she's, uh, balanced on kind of balanced on the left hand side and looking into um, open space and her eyes are again on the rule of thirds here. Now, what we're looking for is balance. And one of the important features is how you place your main subject of your photo. As you could see in the uh, previous example of the woman at uh, um, Kanoa Ranch, you could see that her, uh, I put her a little off center. It makes for a more dynamic photo. Um, the asymm asymmetry makes a photo more appealing, uh, causes a visual tension. The only problem with the rule of thirds is that it can also leave wide open empty space in a photo, which may make a scene feel empty but it doesn't, um, let's see, visual weight of yourself, including other objects to fill the empty space. Formal balance. Now, ordinarily, 
they say you don't ever want to put the horizon in the center of the photograph. But there are obviously um, examples where that just isn't going to work. This photograph here of the fall scene was taken in New Hampshire several years ago. And if I hadn't put the horizon, which is right along here, in the center of the photograph, I never would have gotten the fantastic reflections and also the interesting grasses here in the front, which adds um, visual interest. Let's see if I, whoop, let's see. Ah, and this one, my zebra reflections, you might actually recognize because they're hanging on the wall behind me as I do this presentation. And um, when I, when we got to this particular water hole, um, you can see there's the, there was no wind or breeze or anything making any ripples in the water. And I, I took one look at that water hole and I saw the animals that were coming in. I said, this is gonna be really fun because I'm gonna get some fantastic, but pretty much, I don't know if you can see it. I know I'm having trouble seeing it down at the bottom. This line, right here is pretty much in the center of the photograph. The one over here, this was actually taken at um, Desert Botanical Gardens. And I centered, I centered the photograph with on the window but what makes it interesting is the various different sizes of the bottles in the, in the window here. And um, it gives it kind of a uh, more visual appear than if the bottles were all straight across. Informal balance is a little more difficult. It occurs when dissimilar elements balance each other out on each side of the frame. mom and baby, the weight of mom on this side is balanced by the little guy over here. The photograph is definitely balanced, but it's also asymmetrical. Uh, I'm glad to see this. I bet this is one of the photographs I lost when my computer died yesterday. Um, this is a great photograph. Took, took this photograph on uh, Sue Rock's Lost Barrios field trip uh, let's see, it would have to be a couple of years now. And um, that's a great field trip. It's a wonderful long block of shops that um, where the owners allowed us to come in and take photographs of anything in the shop. There was only one shop that would not allow us to do that, but most of them were very very uh, amenable to our coming in and taking photographs, very unusual in a shop. Um, but this was one of the doors nearby. And what I like about this is it's straight on, but what helps balance the photograph or make it more interesting is this stairway coming down on the left-hand side. Ah. Uh, Somebody once asked me how long it took me to make, put that composite together. And I laughed <laughs> because number one, I would never be able to do that. And this is actually like a shot that wasn't posed or anything, but you can, I love it. It talk about asymmetrical balance. The big tree here balances the giraffe. We've got, animals kind of in the front and in the back. And overall, the photograph is really balanced. It wasn't planned. It was just happened to be there at the right time. Leading lines is another uh, kind of compositional thing to think about when you're taking photographs. Um, Bird photography field trip down in Tubac uh, in uh, 
uh, Tubac or Tumacacari, I can't remember which. And as we're walking along the ends of trail, I heard um, horses behind and I turned around and grabbed this shot. Um, we have some open space on the right-hand side, the riders are kind of leading into the open space. Um, I would call that a leading lines photograph. And then obviously this is another shot in Africa, but what intrigues me especially, there are a couple of things. One is the road really draws your eyes back to the zebras here, zebras as they call them back here. But what I wasn't planning on was this hyena right down here in the lower right hand corner, which really um, kind of balances the zebras up here. And by the way, um, just to do a little bit of a promo, uh, part of tonight's travelogue is the first part of my Africa trip. So if you have not seen um, seen my shows before, um, I if you love animals and just are curious about Africa, I really encourage you to tune into tonight's um, travelogue. Um, my portion of it is is long. It's cup, probably a couple of glasses of wine long, um, but I, I think you'll enjoy it. Even if you've seen it before, people often ask me to show it again. So that's why I'm doing it again. Okay, so diagonals. As you uh, saw in the first part of this presentation, I showed this. And I know when I saw this, as I say, this was taken in film. So I had to wait for the processing to be done and the photos to come back. And when I saw it, it really, um, and I didn't understand why at the time, um, I, it really uh, took my breath away when I saw this photograph because this, this super strong diagonal right here with the uh, mesas and buttes in the background um, really makes a phenomenally strong photograph. And one of the other places that I like to photograph, and every time I go, I take a picture of this particular scene. Um, this is at uh, Tohono Chul, and um, and I love the. Whoops, let me see. Uh oh. I'll get to the chat afterwards. Okay, Cooper. I apologize for the dog. Come here, Cooper. So I, I like how this, how the um, steps kind of curve around here and the tree on the right hand side balances the palm down here on the left. Um, one of my favorite shots. I never get tired of taking that particular photo. Um, I'll have to do it again because it probably left with the hard drive yesterday. Okay, here's another example of diagonal. This photo was taken at uh, Rancho de la Osa on a field trip several years ago. And um, not only is it, do I love it because of the color, but again, the strong diagonal really um, makes the photograph. Now, perspective or viewpoint. Um, we tend to be, to just stand up and take our photos straight on. But um, I got this photograph at uh, Tucson, Tucson Meet Yourself quite a long time ago when it was um, in the La Placida development, which I think they're tearing down now. But anyway, I was watching, there was a mariachi group playing and I was watching from um, a kind of a terrace up above. And I, I just, I watched her and I thought, you know, this is, this is really a fantastic photograph. 
because she is she has no idea I'm taking it. She is just dancing her little heart out to the music. And she really composed this herself. What really helps in this photograph also is the shadow. And this, this is a total luck shot, really, which if you take enough photographs, you're going to get a lot of good luck shots. And um, those, you know, those usually turn out to be some of the best. But I like, I like the upper viewpoint on this particular photo. Now, odd numbers also help in your composition. They seem to ba balance uh, the photographs. Three, five, seven, don't want to add too many, uh, can be, become too cluttered. Now, the photograph on the left was taken in Tanzania. We watched these uh, gray crown uh, cranes moving across the field. And I had, um, I had, I always had my camera set on burst so I could, because things were moving all the time over there. So I, I knocked off about three or four shots and this was the last one, just an amazing accident to capture this shot. One of my very favorite photographs from the entire trip. And then these kids, these were in uh, a Maasai village, and um, this was not posed. They were all standing there watching us uh, elder Americans come in, and um, they wanted to be there when we came into the village. And even though this little guy back here makes six, you hardly even notice him, but the five, the four boys, and one little girl here in the front. But that's, uh, again, one of my favorite photos on my wall in my Arizona room. OK, another tip is framing. Um, this is taken, you might even, those of you who like to go down to Tubac a lot, you might even recognize this shot. This is in the La Encantada or La Entrada, whatever they call it, area down there. And um, I like to walk around in that area sometimes and just see what's there to take photographs of. And turned around and saw this and, and thought, okay, so this is gonna be a good example of framing. This is one of my very favorite shots of the mission. And if you haven't, been, if you like to go to the mission and take photographs and you haven't been to the back, you are really missing something because I think that's even prettier than the front. You can see all the different layers in here, all the different levels of the buildings behind, of the building behind here. These are um, where the uh, priests and other people that work there live, so you can't really go inside to the patio. But um, and I lucked out because there was there were fantastic clouds that day, and I like this. I prefer this shot in black and white over the color shot. It it really shows the um, different levels uh, much better. And let's see if I can remember where this was taken. I think this was taken at Rancho de la Osa too, but again, a straight on shot framing. And in this case, um, it helps to have, have everything weighted evenly on either side. Fill your frame. Love this portrait on the left hand side. Um, tombstone again. I always I whenever I see this, I, I just can't help but wonder what he was thinking of because he was in a totally different world that day or that at that particular moment. He never knew I took this photograph. I took another one, but I really prefer this one. Um, I, it, it just speaks to me. And then it doesn't necessarily have to be 
you don't necessarily have to see a face. Um, took this at um, White Stallion Ranch. Um, I've got a lot of photographs of this horse with this woman. And uh, when I really zoomed in and filled the frame, um, this turned out to be my favorite. Okay, so horizontal versus vertical. Suggestion is if, that if you can, try both because you never, until you really get a chance to put your photographs on the computer and to really take a look at them and analyze them, you really might not be able to decide which way you prefer to shoot or have the photo turn out. So um, this was, these were taken, I think in Sasabe, I'm not sure, was coming back from Ranch Rancho de la Osa and there was this pretty little chapel um, and we stopped and took photographs because that's what we do in the camera club when we're on a field trip. We always look for new opportunities to take different photographs. But I prefer the, one, the, the vertical one, but the one on the uh, horizontal is also interesting. Obviously color has a lot to do with composition that are going to stand out more than others. Um, this was a display at um, Tucson Botanical Gardens right around um, probably October or so, be just before Halloween. And I love the color, color. and you see one other um, compositional rule in here that are actually a couple of other compositional rules in here that work in this photograph. The diagonal of the straw bale, bales here and the asymmetrical balance of the photograph. Now, I tried and tried and tried for a long time to get any decent butterfly photographs and finally was able to uh, get some good ones uh, by, me, by being persistent at the Desert Museum. But this one, I think, was taken at Tohono Chul. And the, the um, trying to think of the right word, uh, complementary colors of the orange and the blue really make the photograph stand out. All right, so you can unmute yourself if you want to. And I've thrown a lot of stuff out today. I'm gonna to put up some photos for us to discuss and hear what rules you think are represented in these photos. So I'm going to, okay. Anybody that wants to chip in, feel free to unmute yourself. Now, I did not take this photo. I wish I had. My son-in-law actually took this photo in York Beach, Maine. And he, um, I wish he lived closer because whenever we talk, we, we always talk camera stuff. It's always photography. Um, but this is a, a grab shot that he took actually with the bridge camera, which is what basically I use as well. Um, and I just, I, this is my favorite photograph that he's ever taken. And uh, the action is just superb. And we're seeing asymmetrical, but diagonal. The diagonal is really strong, makes for a very strong photograph here, but the action is just spectacular. And his lighting is perfect. <laughs> I hear somebody out there on a, Anybody want to say something? Isn't this wonderful? Okay. Going to go on to another one of Eric's shots. Uh, if anybody is from Maine or northern New England, you probably recognize this place. You, what you will notice, and which has nothing to do with composition, is that 
this photograph is very noisy. And the darker your photograph is, the more likely you are to have noise, especially in a bridge camera. Now he took this with a camera that I actually sent to him, um, a Canon bridge camera that I didn't care for at all. I use Panasonic's myself, but he loved it. And uh, the noise is caused by uh, bridge cameras have smaller sensors and, um, mm. and which cause more noise. But I love the composition. Obviously he spent a lot of time planning for this shot and was fortunate enough to have the weather um, help him out with it. But um, a terrific photograph by Eric. Linda, could, yeah. you, could you give us beginners uh, a definition of noise in a photograph? Oh boy. <laughs> what? I said, oh boy. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's okay. It's, um, hmm. Well, visually you can see it here. It's all these little tiny dots and the noise is, um, it's a, for lack of a better, or yeah, a better term, it's like a digital apparition. Um, it's, it's caused by too high an ISO, which I don't know whether they went into ISO and all of that earlier in this in this thing, but we can spend some time going through some basic stuff at the end of this. Um, but it is, uh, there are programs, and in, in fact, a couple of programs in like Elements, and um, I use one in a series of programs called Nick Collections that will reduce the noise in a photograph, but it's, it's a you, you won't find noise on a, on, in film. So it's caused, it's one of those things that happens with digital photography. Linda, I think of it as kind of a grainy look on some pictures. Right, that exactly. You can't, yeah. Exactly, very good. And, and also uh, one of the things I used to, I used to <laughs> a little in my, when I was taking film photographs and film, I often used a, a slightly grainy type film because I liked a little grain, but you know, in the camera club, they kind of, mm, you know, they, they'll mention noise in your photograph when you, if you show it, but so we try to get rid of it, but there are times when the grainy effect is, is very, works very well in a photograph. Like in one of your cowboy pictures they did. Uh, the first one? Uh, one of them you showed today, I think was, you had a grainy filter or something. Okay, that the, the stagecoach driver, the first one I showed were the rule of thirds. We can go back. That actually is not noise in that. No, I mean, just a grainy look. Well, I, I, in that particular kind of photograph, I kind of like the look yeah. of the look. Yeah. Okay. So I, that's not a real good explanation, but it's as good as you're going to get from me today. <laughs> <laughs> now we've got fantastic color in this photograph. It's an, sort of an odd hard to tell how many flowers are in here, but it's an asymmetrical balance, but we've got the diagonal coming up this way. So that, that helps in the overall composition of that. Let's see what else we've got here. Uh, and there's really no, no compositional rule here, but I had to put it in here I had this, I took this photograph a long time ago, probably with my first digital camera, which was a camera that my brother 
got me for when I retired. It was an Olympus, like Olympus pocket camera. It was 2.8 megapixels or something like that. It was, you know, way back in the very early days. But I've never seen this scene at the Desert Museum again. <laughs> Um, so I just had to put it in because it makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. That's seven. Oh, very good. The odd number. Yeah. <laughs> I'll remember next time I give this presentation. <laughs> well, what was really funny is um, this little guy right over here, he was, everybody else was lying down. They were kind of hunkering down together. And this guy just wormed his way right in there. And... <laughs> It was like I watched him just snuggle right down to fit in. It was very fun. Linda Maynard yes. Hadley, I'd like to ask about that photo. You took okay. that a long time ago. Would you change the composition if you were to take that same photo again? No. Using your thirds or anything? Or is that fine the way that is in the center? It, you know what? What? Um, it's, an, it's asymmetrical. We've got one, two, three, four, five javelinas over here on the left-hand side, which are kind of all packed together. And then out here, we've got the two guys that are all stretched out to kind of balance the photograph on the right. So actually, compositionally, it's pretty, it's pretty good. They, they really did me a big favor by lying down that way. <laughs> and how long did it take you to train them to do that? Um, a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I and I, I, I don't know how many times I've been to the Desert Museum and walked through the Havelina exhibit and stuff, and I have just never, ever seen this again. I was just, you know, we all know that a lot of photography is being at the right place at the right, right time, and. Um, and that's why they say you should always have a camera with you, which I am the worst offender for because I don't always have a camera with me and I don't carry my cell phone and really don't want to take pictures with my cell phone. Um, I'm a diagonal camera user and that's because I'm, that's what I know and what I'm used to. So, uh, but anyway, but I happen to have that little camera with me and probably the the one and only photograph from the Desert Museum that I really remember, although I've got a couple of really great bar, uh, Bobcat pictures, which I hope did not go when my hard drive died yesterday. But I'll have to go back and look in my external hard drive and see if they're on there. I hope. I'm praying. The vegetation also, it does a nice job of framing. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And I believe I'm looking at this over here. I think this might be a chuparosa here, if anybody is into plants. Um, doesn't have any blossoms on it, but the shape and everything looks like a chuparosa. Don't know what this is. <laughs> so this is obviously a posed photograph, and um, it was taken by Wally Watson who leads our uh, Tucson Windows and Doors field trips. And um, I ran, recently ran into his wife and said, you know, Wally could be leading Tucson Windows and Doors field trips right now because we generally do social distance and they're outdoors and we could wear masks. And I, excuse me, I haven't heard from Wally, but um, he's kind of He's kind of missing doing the field trips. He does several. And if you don't do any other field trip with the camera club, you must do the windows and doors field trip. Uh, he takes you into um, the, old, the old barrios where they're kind of, they're not really hidden, but unless you know they're there, you probably won't find them. And they're always changing. Um, I, I'm not sure when the first time was but that I did a windows and doors field trip, but I've done at least a dozen. 
and I have photographs of what a building looked like 15 years ago and what a building looks like today. And they're very different. Um, so you can go back and do them over and over and over again. And one of the things that I like to do, um, because I have done them so many times, is before I go or just or when I get there, I, I uh, challenge myself to take only like, let's say, close ups or uh, windows or, you know, pick, pick a subject, pick a theme and <clears throat> You won't want to do this the first time you go because there's just too much to photograph. But if you've done it, as I say, as many times as I have, um, that's something I, I like to do is challenge myself. And you never know what kind of photographs you've been overlooking when you've been there in the past. Um, there's always something new to see. So I'm going to, let's see. Um, I don't know how brief it was. I threw a lot of stuff at you today, but um, Jean says this is going to be online. So if you want to go back and review, you can go to our YouTube channel. I think it's um, Green Valley Camera Club. You could try that or GVR Camera Club. And um, there's a, probably a whole bunch of YouTubes up there right now. Um, anyway, I'm going to come back to, I'm screen sharing, stop share. Come back. Okay. Questions, thoughts. Why you guys are quiet. <laughs> All right, I've got a- uh, I have a quick question. Okay. Um, how many of your photos do you go back and, and work with like Photoshop elements or whatever to reframe it or to, uh, uh, you know, basically take a a so-so shot and and sort of reconfigure it so you got the, the focus point on on the one of the vertices or uh, you know you try to maybe eliminate one one subject so you have an odd number that kind of thing or create okay. that imbalance. That's a that's a great question for today. Um, well, I shoot. And I, we haven't, I don't think we've gone into this at the club, at, at any of this class, but I shoot in RAW rather than JPEG. Um, I, I shoot actually shoot both formats, but the JPEG is only so I can see what I've just taken in my camera. Um, so any photograph that you see of mine has been processed in elements because you have to process a raw photograph or it looks awful. But there are big advantages to shooting in raw, which I can go into in a little bit if you want to. But as far as composition is concerned, not really very often. Sometimes I'll crop uh, a little tighter. Um, I don't, I can't really think of too many times when I've really done a major reconstruction. Uh-oh. Sorry. A major reconstruction, what I would call of my, of my photographs. Cooper. So I, I, I really work hard um, to work on the, on the composition of my photographs. Linda, do you still sell some of your prints? Um, yep, I can, um, I have some of them. I don't, I haven't been that active. I have a, uh, I guess a page or have my photographs on a, a website called Red Bubble. And um, you, can, you can buy prints, canvases, although I know <laughs> Cooper, I know Sue didn't have a very good experience with the red bubble canvas. So I wouldn't recommend uh, 
getting a canvas from them. There are other, if anybody's interested in canvases, I can give you the name. I use a canvas discount for my photographs and they do a great job and they're very reasonable. Um, but yeah, I, I, some, of my, some of these photographs are on Redbubble. I haven't spent a lot of time putting a, lo a lot of my stuff on there recently, but I probably should. It, interestingly enough, I've probably gotten more sales during this pandemic than I got than I got all of last year or the year before, I should say. Because people are, you know, they're curious. Some of they're actually making masks with photographs. I have a few of my uh, photographs on masks, um, which has been kind of interesting. But people are not just buying masks. They're buying all kinds of different things. Thank you. So Redbubble.com red is where you can you can check it out. Any other questions? Let's see. I'll look at chat here and see what we're doing here. Um, Linda, thank you because I finally figured out how to get the grid back on my camera. <laughs> oh, good. So and I was messing with that as I'm listening to you. I finally found it again. Good. I was motivated by what you were teaching us, so thanks. Oh, excellent. So Marilyn, you wanna tell us how you could photograph a bird? <laughs> no, we, we won't. Is that like a trick question? <laughs> we won't put you on the spot, Never mind. Um, yes, I will be doing the Element SIG on Thursday. And will I be doing a knit class in the future? Mm, probably not, because I tie it in with, um, the element SIG so that we can demonstrate um, Nick, you can do Nick on its, on its own, but it works much better, I think, if you do it in conjunction with Photoshop or Photoshop elements. So I kind of teach the, the two together. This was just great. It was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for the dog. No, that's fine. Cooper. Cooper, I don't need protection from them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. I, I really, I'm a huge believer in anybody can improve their photographs if they just pay some attention to the composition. Guaranteed, guaranteed, 100%. Um, it, you, you don't have to have a built-in eye, as people say. Oh, she's got a wonderful eye. Well, some people do, but um, just following a few of these suggestions that I gave out today, uh, you can really, really improve your photographs. And I, I'll tell you, I am the perfect example of that because in the early days, if I got a really terrific photograph, it was really more luck and I, because I didn't understand. Um, but now understanding um, more of the, the uh, things that make a really good picture, um, my photographs have really improved a lot. We need guidance, though. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I can give you guidance if you want to come to my Photoshop Elements SIG on Thursday at 930. We do an hour and a half, and sometimes we run over because I don't mind running over <laughs> if we get really excited about a photograph. And it, during that time, we sometimes do talk about composition. And, <coughs> excuse me, so if you need guidance, send me a couple about them in the SIG. What I do usually with the SIG is um, you send me a photograph that you like, but you think could be made better. And I will run a few, hopefully simple, but sometimes not so simple techniques on how to improve them. Um, and along with improving the photograph is often or can be uh, improving the composition. So that would be something. And if you 
Um, if you don't know how to get into my SIG, you can go on Wild Apricot under events and uh, my SIG is listed under the, the different special interest groups. You can click on that and sign up and you will automatically get a link every week to the, to the SIG. And um, I, have to, I have to admit that I'm not really great at remembering to record it. So it's a good idea for you to be there. <laughs> But that's, that's you. how you can get you can get additional um, help that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Linda, Look Maynard forward Hadley. to seeing you there. Excuse Hi, me, Maynard. Uh, a quick question. Okay. Now, thank you so much for this uh, lecture today. But when you started out, you started out with rule of thirds, and then went leading lines and balance and everything. Do you try to line up all of those when you're doing a photo or are you looking for a specific one initially? Now it's usually, um, it usually depends on hmm, where I am and what kind of situation I'm in. Like the, uh, when I'm doing the portraits, as an example in Tombstone, um, I've got a ton of terrific Tombstone portraits. Um, and in that case, usually the subject is stationary, usually. And I like, and one of the, uh, you know, I, we haven't, I talked a little bit about the kind of camera I use. I use um, bridge cameras, which are, um, uh, smaller, they're not SLRs, there's no interchangeable lens, but it has a long telephoto. So sometimes I can zero in on somebody that's quite a distance away from me who isn't even going to, and the cameras are fairly small. They're, well, you're not going to be able to see this, but they're maybe finger to finger like this size in size, whereas the DSLRs are like this. And so I can um, I can sometimes kind of hide myself and, um, in those cases, even if somebody knows that I'm, they, they look around and they see me with the camera, they'll hold a pose that, that I was looking for as a candid. And, um, in those cases, I try to use the rule of thirds almost exclusively. Um, that's the one I use most often. When, when you're doing your rule of thirds, are you then focusing like on the eye or something and then locking that and recomposing or how are you doing that? You know what? I think um, actually Marilyn just mentioned it a minute ago. Cameras will in your menu allow you to set up the grid, the rule of thirds grid. So when you're, when you're looking through the viewfinder, you'll see the grid and you can, and you can use the grid to help you, you know, uh, focus on the rule of thirds. Now I've been doing this for so long that the rule of thirds is probably in my brain. <laughs> and so I don't, I don't, I don't need the, I don't need the grid. It's just kind of automatic with me. But if you're just starting out, look in your camera manual and see, and see if somewhere, and it'll probably be in, let's see, the, the menus, I think most cameras are set up this way. There's one menu for, um, let's see. There's one menu for changes that you might want to make quite often in your, when you're doing your photographs. And then there's a me another menu for something like tools where you set it up once and it's there. You'll find uh, under tools, you'll find things like a histogram, which I don't really want to go into today. Um, probably the grid, the rule of thirds grid. Sometimes, um, 
I think in one of my cameras it has a horizon line that will show you whether your photograph is a little bit off kilter. And I will tell you that um, one of the things that um, I usually hone in on in my SIG is I can almost always tell if a, if a photograph is a little bit tilted and we all do it. I go back and look at my photographs and I go, you know, it's tilted. I have to, I have to level it. And that you can do in, in something like elements. But yeah, rule of thirds is the one that I use most of the time. Leading lines like the zebras on the, on the road, that was just, you know, we were parked in the road and I just looked down the road and I, it, it was an automatic leading lines photograph to me. Um, diagonals, that's, that's pretty much, that's just by sight, you can tell if, if a photograph is gonna give you a strong diagonal in, a, in that photograph. The, the biggest one, um, my example is my monument, my early monument valley photograph, which I'm looking at the painting right now across the room, um, that, that diagonal. And, I, you know, and it was really interesting because I knew it was an amazing photograph. And I've seen other photographs by people um, almost exactly like mine. And, um, and it, it still takes my breath away when I see it because it's so strong. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome, Maynard. Anybody else? Okay, how many people did we have today? 28, ooh, that's good. Great. Okay, any, let's see, any other? polling experience, we don't need to do that. Uh, I think I've covered. Oh yeah, somebody, somebody mentioned uh, one of our members has several pr prints for sale at uh, Octopus, I think it is, right? Octopus Car Wash, Carrie? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, This is ridiculous. I just, I know him like I know my own name and I can't think of it. Is it Page? Yeah, Dick, Dick Page. Okay. Dick's, been doing, Dick's been doing that for a long time. And I think it, he's been very successful with that. And I, I know a couple of other of our members have put photographs over there as well. Um, there aren't too many places. Well, Jerry Marion has some contacts around Green Valley where he, he displays our, the club's photographs uh, besides the, um, the rec centers. And of course we can't do that until the rec centers reopen, but um, um, Marty's Bistro hangs some of our photographs, but I'm not sure where you would go to, um, to try to sell your photographs. The, other, the only place that I'm aware of is Octopus. And Dick has that area pretty well locked up as he should, his photographs are phenomenal. And I don't know whether, I'll, I'll do a little aside about Dick. Um, he, um, I've known him probably as long as I've been in the club, which is you know, like, I don't know, 15 years or something, 16 years. And um, when Dick and his wife moved from, I think, New York to Green Valley, Dick was not a photographer, but he's an avid hiker and he hikes in places where you need a permit to hike. So, and he goes by himself. And um, so he had done a whole bunch of these hikes and he would come back home and he'd tell his wife about what he had seen there and so on and so forth. And she said, well, you should be taking pictures of these because I, your, your description isn't really giving me the full value of what you've been seeing. So she got him a small camera, I think a pan, small, like a pocket Panasonic camera. And he, he met um, a fellow, Tom Vizo, who was a published 
bird and wildlife photographer who lived here in Green Valley. And they apparently hit it off and Tom took him under his, took Dick under his wing and really started to him teaching him about photography. And it was at that point when um, Dick improved his equipment and uh, took, packed his equipment into these places where he was hiking. And that's when his phenomenal photography started. Um, the, real, the sad part of the story is that Tom and Dick were out on a photography hike one day and Tom died of a heart attack right there. So, um, but anyway, the, the knowledge that Tom had passed on to him, to Dick, um, really shows in his photography. His photography is just fabulous. So you can, if you ever get a chance to see him, he used, uh, Dick used to show at um, some of the flea market sort of things that would be held around town occasionally. He doesn't do the farmer's market sort of stuff, but um, I would run into him occasionally um, when the Green Valley Gardeners had a an art stuff years ago. He does good, fairly good sized canvases and his canvases for the quality of the photography that he, um, he creates uh, are very reasonable. So anyhow, little plug for Dick. <laughs> <laughs> We don't see him at the club very often, but I think he's out taking photographs. And it's funny, he used to, uh, another thing, he used to, uh, used to come on Tuesday mornings when the, what I call show and tell that Gene wants to resurrect again. Um, he, he'd come and he would show a, a particular photograph and somebody would say, well, you, you should have moved about 25 feet to the right. And Dick would say, I'd be dead, that's a cliff. <laughs> so he goes into some really wild or at least did I don't know if he's still doing it but he used to go into some pretty wild places to take his photographs <laughs> anyway any other questions before we go no okay I hope to do I hope to do uh I have another version, a shorter version of this uh, presentation that I will tell Gene will go into. Um, he's going to kind of do individual, non structured sort of uh, availabilities on, online, and I will I'll do this again. I also have another one which um, I did as a presentation quite a while back in the 10 week course called How to Take Fabulous sun, Sunrise and Sunset Pictures and Other Handy Hints. So I, I can't remember what's in there besides the sunrise and sunset settings near camera, but um, I think I might put that one out there too, because these are, these, are really, these are really fun for me to do. I, I really enjoy teaching and, um, and I love seeing the results when, that people send me when they've taken their uh, their bits of pieces that they've learned in my SIGs and classes and, and made their own thing. So, and in the club. Okay, bye all. Thank bye you, Linda. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yep. Thank you, Linda. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy. Thanks, bye. Bye bye, Linda. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.